Thank you for joining us today. We have a topic that is on everyone's minds, and if not, it should be. The topic is health care and how it affects you as individuals and how it affects people in the Wyndham County area and how it affects one of the major deliverers of health care services in this region, and that is Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. Our pleasure for the first time in this setting to have the hospital's chief officer, Steve Gordon, with us. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Look forward to it. Now, I, I have to ask, things seem to be changing faster and faster, and you had come into the job several months ago. What did you do to get yourself up to speed, both on some of these changes within Vermont and get the lay of the landscape? That was a great question, but um, it actually happened before I came um, to town. Uh, I started February 28th, but really probably two months before as I was uh, leaving my previous job in Brockton, Massachusetts, I started doing my own research both uh, in details of what was going on in the state of Vermont in terms of uh, new legislation uh, to enact uh, and look at a single payer system, to look at payment reform. Also uh, did a lot more homework in terms of the community and in terms of the hospital itself. The community itself, uh, Vermont is of course known for the fact that our young people are leaving in droves and SUVs, taking a train, etc. But we do have a high percentage of more elderly population than some parts of the country do here. How does that affect the ability to uh, serve them and, uh, and cater to their want to uh, live a long and healthy life? Well, you have to have a vibrant hospital, vibrant medical care in the area. And, you know, Vermont has probably the, um, the oldest population um, in, in the Union. And Wyndham County is probably one of the oldest counties um, uh, in, the, uh, um, in Vermont. So we have very significant challenges from there. But on the other hand, we also have a very vibrant uh, OB department. We uh, uh, birthed um, 370 um, babies this year. So on one hand, we, we do have um, um, an older population that we have to serve, but we also have a younger population um, that has been fairly stable as well at the hospital. One of the things I've noticed even more so over the last year is that the hospital organization has taken to uh, uh, running or managing physician practices, whereas before a doctor or a group of doctors would uh, say, well, I'll do this and I'll do the paperwork and everything. But now it looks as though more and more of them are becoming hospital employees, not just in Brattleboro, but elsewhere. How come? Well, Brattleboro is probably the last uh, hospital that really got on the, um, the bandwagon, if you will, for employing physicians. And, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, um, was a time where physicians could come out of medical school with reasonable debt and put out a shingle and start practicing. But things have gotten so much more complicated, both in terms of paperwork, in terms of malpractice insurance, just the business of healthcare has gotten more complicated. We're, um, you know, we're spending uh, half a million dollars on a new uh, practice management system, an electronic medical record for our physician practices. It's almost cost prohibitive for an independent physician uh, to go out and create a or purchase an electronic medical record. So the economics of practicing medicine um, are much different than they were, you know, 30 years ago when a number of our physicians um, came to the area and, and opened up their practices. And so younger physicians as well coming out now, it's not unheard of that they have $200,000, $250,000 of debt uh, on the books. Um, and they're not looking necessarily at taking a risk and going into a private practice scenario. Um, the other piece of it, medicine itself has changed. Doctors aren't um, uh, looking um, forward to call, you know, being on 24-7. Um, the hospital has responded. We now have a, um, a hospitalist service, so if you're admitted to the hospital, um, you get uh, served and treated by a trained physician in hospital care. Um, your um, private practice physician can come visit, but your care is really managed by the hospitalist. There are some doctors that are still doing inpatient hospital care for their patients, but uh, the vast majority of doctors coming out 
certainly um, out of their training and residency, are looking at establishing practices both in an employment scenario because of the security, because of it's cost prohibitive to do it on their own, like it's like establishing your own business, um, and for a better life work balance and not having to come in at two o'clock in the morning uh, to the hospital to take care of a patient. So we've really seen a paradigm shift over the last really um, you know, 20, 30 years. Kind of uh, is different than the old country doctor. I mean, I'll, I'll give you the example that I think of. When I was born in, in 1956, the doctor that delivered me at Brattleboro Memorial Hospital was a country doctor from Northfield, Massachusetts, who drove over the old, now closed Shell Bridge, and he had his office in his home, he made house calls, and really, it's changed a lot since then. Huge. A doctor like that couldn't survive economically today, let alone getting malpractice insurance. <laughs> so um, it just, you know, like every other business, it's gotten much more complicated. Um, back then, um, and I'm a year older than you. Um, you don't look but, it. Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> but uh, I think, uh, you know, back then, it was a cash business as well. Um, insurance wasn't as, as prevalent as it is now. And when you look at um, um, what insurance um, and bureaucracy has done in the physician practices, let alone the hospital, it's gotten it much more complicated. Now you need to think about what insurance someone carries, what the copay is, and making sure that that copay is collected because that's an important part of what's been a, a big buzzword out there, fee for service, making sure that uh, the people who deliver the care, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a doctor, get somewhere near the cost of that service being delivered. Well, and that's why we also have what they term cost shifting now, where you have uh, a governmental payers not paying really the true cost and the true cost being borne um, by the commercial payers. Um, so and that's one of the drivers to look at a single payer system so that you don't have that cost shift between the payers. And nowadays, many of the physicians are in primary care. Uh, some specialize, some do not. How does the uh, hospital work with both groups of doctors? Well, Brattleboro has been very successful in recruiting new physicians. We've recruited uh, five new primary care physicians. Um, this month, uh, we actually next week, we're opening up our new um, office up in Putney. Um, we've um, been managing the Putney Medical Office uh, for about two years with Richard Fletcher and Maggie Lake. We recruited Carrie Dickey, who's a new family doc, and uh, we purchased the former River Valley Credit Union building right on Main Street and we've rehabbed that as a new medical office. So um, Putney will have a new you know, uh, facility there uh, with a relatively new doctor, and we're very excited about that. We now have um, uh, Lauren McClure, um, family medicine physician, along with um, uh, Peter and Janine Foote um, uh, on uh, Fairway uh, Road in terms of uh, a new office uh, there with Dean Bresnahan. So we've really done a lot to recruit new um, primary care physicians uh, to the area. Do we have the kind of critical mass where uh, additional physicians are needed or how does that number look? Well I think w one of the uh, key specialties at this point um, we just we're, we're, this summer we'll have a new OBGYN physician joining us, Ellen Garvey, who's a resident in Hinsdale. She's graduating from the uh, Dartmouth uh, residency in OBGYN. Uh, she's joining our practice. Um, and um, we have a new hospitalist joining us from University of Pennsylvania, um, uh, Ada Avic. Her um, um, husband's uh, family is from Brattleboro, so she, she's coming back to the area, the family's coming back to the area. So we've been very lucky and, and successful in recruiting new physicians. Um, and we've done a lot in terms of marketing those uh, new physicians and taking new patients. Um, the one area that we are currently looking for is an ear, nose, and throat uh, specialist, and we have a doc coming um, the end of this uh, month with his family to look at the area. So we're hoping uh, that'll work out. Well, as someone who uh, has spent a considerable amount of time with ear, nose, and throat specialists over the year, I hope that uh, they do choose Brattleboro. Yeah, me too. Me too. Now, the doctors are just one part of this. Over the years, Brattleboro Memorial Hospital has done a remarkable job on upgrading its facility, 
I would uh, take note of just a couple of years ago, the addition of the Richards mm -hmm. Building, consolidating a lot of uh, different functions, but I see there's still more to go. Oh, much more. Um, we have uh, in front of, we put in fr fr front of the state um, an application uh, to basically expand uh, the emergency department and bring it to the 21st century. The last time the ED um, was expanded or built, um, in its current configuration was in the early nine, uh, 1980s, I think it was 1982. And the ER at that time was slated to handle about 5,000 patients a year. We're now close to or over 13,000 patients with very limited changes in the footprint and in the cap capacity, the bed capacity. So our goal with this new project is uh, to double the bed capacity to 10 beds, um, not just the beds themselves, but also um, the purposing of the beds. One of the areas we have a real problem now is handling some of our um, psychiatric patients that we see in the emergency department or substance abuse, and uh, we will have two uh, secured rooms um, to handle those patients. Um, we'll also have two, ro two um, uh, rooms that would be for rapid treatment. So you don't have to wait an hour and a half. You can get in and out within 20 to 30 minutes if you have a minor you know, injury or, or illness and be seen by, uh, by either a uh, physician or a mid-level. Um, and uh, we, we've got to clean up even our registration function. You know, when you walk into our ER, you're walking into the same entrance that the ambulance patients come in via stretchers. Then you go to the same desk that everyone else goes to, so there's limited privacy. We've got, and we've been cited for that by uh, CMS, um, Medicare, the state joint commission, that we've got to have a different approach for that in a much more private, um, compliant, confidential uh, uh, area. So our new design will have a separate entrance in the front of the hospital for ambulatory emergency uh, patients, patient, ER walk-in patients, as opposed to the ambulance. Uh, patients will also have three bays instead of the existing two bays that we have for the ambulances. So it's really a complete re reconfiguration that really um, uh, meets the needs of what we are seeing now and what we anticipate for the future. So more shorter stays and less people staying long periods of time as a patient? Absolutely, that's the goal. Is we've got to, you know, look constantly look at reducing our wait times in the emergency department, um, and as well as um, reducing the number of folks. About two percent um, of our patients leave before getting um, uh, treated. Uh, we want to get that down. Our goal is to get that down to zero. I'm curious: Are people using the emergency room who really should be using their primary care doctor in this day and age? Of course. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and part of it is a convenience factor. You know, the ER is open 24-7, and we take all comers. Um, I think, uh, though, what you will see if, um, and we're seeing it already, is more and more insurance companies saying, you got to go see your primary care physician first or make that call first. Um, but I think you're always going to see um, those minor uh, things because of convenience factor. If a doc is off that day, the office might be closed, where are those patients going to go? And they'll come to the emergency department. You talked about psychiatric and substance abuse patients. Brattleboro, of course, is home to the Brattleboro Retreat, another fine health care facility. Absolutely. How much do you work with them in reducing what really could be a dangerous issue in your own emergency room? Well, there, there are a number of things happening in the local community um, with, with the retreat as well as with HCRS. Um, HCRS has recently opened up their own crisis center across from the retreat. Um, now, it's not 24-7 yet, but those are patients that are going into crisis that um, have an alternative to go to as opposed to coming to the emergency department. Now, if rescue uh, brings a patient in, they have to come to the hospital. That's a requirement, um, a medical requirement uh, for that patient to be medically cleared for appropriate psychiatric uh, uh, transfer uh, to a different facility like the retreat or somewhere else. Uh, but we're all working closely together. We're actually now providing the medical coverage for the retreat patients. Um, um, uh, and that's, that program started several months ago. So uh, the other piece of it, too, is one of the programs that's really being promoted in the state of Vermont called the Medical Home. 
It's a concept that um, is financially funded by the state as well as the federal government, where we're um, um, able to work with primary care practices with a community health team involving both psychiatric services, housing services, with Brattleboro Housing Department, with HCRS, with the retreat, and others to really wrap around those primary care practices other services that patients need to keep them well, keep them out of the hospital, keep them out of the emergency department. So we just started that program. Um, actually, Richard Davis is our uh, uh, care coordinator to uh, bring in you know, services from uh, around the community to help patients that are part of the medical home. And we have two practices right now um, designated as medical homes. Um, that is Barbara Primary Care and Wyndham Family Medicine. That's Tom Evans's practice. Um, by uh, this summer and by the end of the summer, um, I hope to have all of our primary care physicians uh, that are employed by the hospital as part of uh, the medical home because we'll be deploying and having our electronic medical record system up, which will make it a lot easier for us to get those patients um, uh, into this program. So a bit of a paradigm shift there. Uh, in the past, you've had physicians and hospitals treating people who were ill, but some of the things that were making them ill were not being addressed. Now you can work on that as well. And that's where I think um, you know, everyone's looking at is how do we move the system from an illness-based system, and that's how reimbursement works, to a wellness-based system. And it's very difficult to move that, you know, to have that paradigm shift, um, both in terms of payment reform to people, you know, how do you get um, folks to take care of themselves? Um, you know, we've got a huge problem with um, obesity, juvenile diabetes. It's stuck in my chest here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, that, that is a whole issue of lifestyle and how, how do we get um, uh, the um, patients more and the population more responsible for their own health care? Um, because we've got some big issues, uh, you know, a big uh, bubble of um, juvenile diabetes and obesity uh, that we are going to be faced with. Um, in the coming years, and it's going to play out in terms of more medical care. The big question is how do we work with community members in uh, setting the example but not being punitive with, of course, the realization you've got to be financially punitive at some point. Yeah. And that's where I think the medical home concept really can work well because you can bring those nutritional services uh, to those patients. You can uh, bring diabetic uh, teaching, and we have a lot of those services at the hospital, but also in the community. Um, but you also have to, as you just said, you have to have people motivated to uh, take advantage of those. You know, Steve, we've talked about the hospital as a provider of health care, as uh, a group of people setting the example for healthy living within Wyndham County. I mean, the, the health fair over the years has been really quite, uh, quite beneficial. But we haven't talked about the hospital as being a major employer in this community, in this county. And for a small town, that counts for a lot. Yeah, it's, it's huge. When you, we have about 450 full-time equivalent, um, in total about 550 employees. Um, our payroll and benefits are probably about $46 million. That's a lot. Um, and when you look at those uh, metrics, I think that's either one of the lar either the largest or one, certainly in the top three uh, in Wyndham County in terms of uh, employers. So we're an economic driver um, and uh, in terms of our employment uh, and, and in terms of um, you know, uh, providing the community with a hugely valuable service. No, you're, you're right about that. Where do you see? that going because as healthcare changes, uh, what people do and the numbers of people needed to do it are going to change as well, has to. And um, you know, that's, you know, healthcare is, one thing you can count on in healthcare is change, both in terms of technology, both in terms of our services that we offer. And um, you know, for a hospital our size, and we're a small hospital, um, we're actually one of the larger hospitals when you look at Vermont because the majority of the hospitals in Vermont are 
what they call critical access hospitals, 25 beds and under. Um, and we run an average daily census of probably about 25, but so much more is done now on an outpatient uh, basis, ambulatory surgery, all of the outpatient clinics that we have. Um, I really look at us as um, not so much as an independent individual hospital with physicians, but we've got to start looking at ourselves as a healthcare system. And the technology that we're deploying now will get us there, um, that we can share with the physician offices electronically, you know, um, their uh, medical record people's, you know, um, uh, healthcare information, lab tests, those kinds of things. So we've got to get to that point that we're truly a seamless healthcare system. Um, and that's one of the, the challenges we'll have because technology is, is expensive. And uh, that's probably our number one capital other than, let's say, the emergency department, which is about a $7 million uh, capital investment. That is our next level of capital investment will be the technology um, so that we can be prepared for uh, the future. Can a hospital the size of Brattleboro afford to do everything, especially because I'm hearing uh, thinking back to the last round of budget approvals by uh, BISHCA, the State Banking Insurance Securities and Healthcare uh, Department, remember hearing Steve Kimball, the commissioner, say that as much as they may hate to admit it, some of the smaller hospitals around Vermont are going to need to specialize in order to survive. Well, and I think one of the examples is Mount Escutney, um, which has really become more of a um, subacute uh, rehab type uh, facility. Um, I think for us in Brattleboro, because we our draw is about 55,000 um, uh, people, 55,000 inhabitants in the area, that um, we will have to maintain and should maintain our general acute care services um, and our OB services. Um, um, I know that I think it's Claremont Hospital it dropped down to about 150 deliveries and just you just can't sustain an OB service with that volume. So um, I think you know, our focus will continue to have those acute care services. We've got to be careful of what services that we'll, continue, we'll invest in and what new services. I mean, one of the services that I talked to Steve Kimball about is uh, hyperbaric medicine because we have a very vibrant wound care program multidisciplinary wound care program. And having that technology, which are hyperbaric chambers, is a, a very positive one. Um, we're having debate with the state whether they will let us have it. And you, uh, I was gonna say, you currently are having the discussion about whether uh, you merit a full-time fixed MRI machine as well. Well, we already have it. I mean, the, 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 the only, question there is we, we, we've had the MRI machine for probably, I don't know, five or six years, certainly before I came. Um, and it's, it's part of what you need. If you're going to have a, um, a vibrant emergency department to serve your population, you've got to have that technology. And it's not experimental by any stretch of the imagination at this point. So um, one of the parts of the ED project is to take the MRI machine and place it into space that was already built out in the building you mentioned, the Richards building back in 2008, 2009. We have space already there. Um, and we need to do it so that we can use that space to expand the emergency department. Uh, right now, patients who need an MRI have to walk through the ER and our clinical area in the ER uh, to get to the, um, to get to the uh, equipment. And that's just not the appropriate thing. And uh, the ER lease is up and we want to move that machine to space that's inside the Richards building that was already built for it. You know, if you were almost any other business, a lot of the things you speak of would already be done because you're reacting to market conditions. Uh, how tough is it to work within the regulatory field? Well, you know, Vermont for healthcare is, is very well regulated. I, uh, you know, ran a hospital in Derry, New Hampshire for about 13 years, then ran hospitals in Massachusetts. And what you have here is a much more heavily regulated uh, state. Our budgets are reviewed, have to be approved. Um, that's not the case in either New Hampshire or Massachusetts. Um, the thresholds in which to bring new programs to fruition, financial thresholds, are much lower in Vermont. So um, there is a more highly regulated model uh, in Vermont. Um, that's the reality we function in. What's going to be very interesting um, over the coming months is we now have the Green Mountain Care Board which um, 
uh, it has a huge agenda in front of them. Everything from developing the um, different insurance packages for the insurance exchange that would be offered to Vermonters, um, to approving our budgets at the hospital level, to um, approve um, capital in terms of the certificate of need, um, looking at payment reform, you know, looking at um, uh, uh, models of different um, payment reforms, moving away from how we're paid now on an illness basis, on a per test basis, moving towards more of the preventative, um, putting more of the risk, I think, back onto the, or onto the providers, both physicians and hospitals, to care for populations. So everything is in change right now. Um, and uh, as I said, Green Mountain Care Board, um, I think in July, um, once legislation is enacted, will then take on the responsibilities that are currently within BISCA, which is the Banking, Insurance, Securities, and Healthcare Administration, which Steve Kimball, as you mentioned, um, they will take on those responsibilities that formerly were part of BISCA. Wow. A lot, a lot of, of changes. A lot of things changing. So how can the average everyday Joe not only uh, keep a handle on all of the change, but make sure the changes are things that will be beneficial to them and the community at large? Yeah. Well, I'll start with myself, uh, being the average Joe, too. And there's a lot going on. So um, I've been um, more active um, uh, in Montpelier, more active with the hospital association. You know, one of the things we're, we're blessed with here is, is four, only 14 hospitals in the entire state, um, most in fairly non-competitive marketplaces. Now, we're in a fairly competitive marketplace here in Brattleboro because across the river we have Keene, across the border we have Greenfield, uh, Franklin. So we're a little different here than uh, the Northern Kingdom um, or the western part of the state uh, being in the southern tier. So um, I want to make sure that the Green Mountain Care Board and the folks that make up that board um, understand what it means to have a hospital in Brattleboro. Um, what it means to our 450, 500 employees here, that we need a vibrant hospital in this community. So um, I see more of my role over the coming uh, year and coming years representing us, um, not just from Brattleboro in the hospital, but the area um, with the Green Mountain Care Board and getting more involved in the political process with our uh, legislative um, uh, folks here from Brattleboro. Well, we're glad to have you in Brattleboro, and thank you very much for talking with us today. Well, it's been a pleasure. Steve Gordon is the Chief Officer of Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. If you'd like to know more about what's going on at your community hospital, go online to bmhvt.org. This is Tim Johnson. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.